And with that, let us get going here, guys. I want to get the screen share started. And so tell me if you can see my screen here. Um, hopefully you can. And yeah. for some reason, the screen share stops. Just kind of let me know, and I'll try to uh, make sure that the screen is following along. But look, I want to talk a little bit about building a business that's based on advocates, having advocates for you. And so let me just start with this question. Just imagine what would your business be like if you had a couple of friends, right? If you had two friends who could each guarantee you two closed deals every year, how many people would be interested in having a couple of friends? You can do a quick a raise of your hands. It was a thumbs up. Randy's giving a thumbs up. If you had two guaranteed, take to the bank, know that you're going to get two closings a year. What if you had five or maybe 10 friends like that? Would that be something that you would have some interest in? What if each person, instead of being able to give you two guaranteed closings, could give you five? How are you feeling about your business now? Right? Does that take any pressure off of you as a real estate agent? Does that take any pressure off of your lead generation to sort of have this group of folks who you just know you're going to be able to count on? I see an exclamation point perhaps in the chat there. Um, look, that's kind of what we're talking about is how do you make that real? Because I'm here to tell you that you can make this real if you're purposeful about making it happen. So let's start by just a quick definition of what is an advocate, right? Working definition pulled right out of the dictionary, nothing special here. A person who publicly supports or recommends a particular cause or policy. I always like to, because I'm a bit of a geek this way, I always like to look at sort of language and start to figure out what is the root? What is the root part of this word? And, and sort of the, the root of advocate is, is, is vocate. It's to use your voice. It's, it's to speak on behalf of someone else. And so part of what we're trying to figure out is how do we build a database where people are going to tell our story and, and, and sing our praises, right? So part of that is how do you become influential, right? And it's kind of a combination of putting yourself right in the center of people that you know, and people have to, they have to know you, they have to like you, they have to trust you. And when you have all of those things coming together, now you have the opportunity to become influential, right? No guarantee that you will, but without any one of these three things, that's, that's not gonna happen at all, right? We've gotta be in front of people that we know, they have to like us and they have to trust us. And you know, I, I remember hearing a conversation one time with uh, Brian Buffini, who I'll refer to again later. Anybody know Brian Buffini's name? Brian, I, I, I knew Lucy would, right? Brian is just one of the classic trainers of all time. And Lucy, you know, what I love the most about Brian is, is his stories. The guy is this Irish storyteller who is just gifted in, in his ability to tell stories. But what he talks about all the time is people won't do business with you if they don't like you. And people won't do business with you if they don't trust you. So everything that we do when, when starting to build relationships, business relationships is focused on how do I get people to like me more and trust me more. It always comes down to your database. And so we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna to kind of talk about how to interpret the lead generation model of the millionaire real estate agent, right? So much of what we teach here, and Penny, if you're, you're learning a little bit more about other companies, what we believe here is that when things are important, I've heard Gary Kelly say this lots of times, when things are important and outcome matters, then people need to rely on proven models and not leave things to chance. If it's not important and things don't really matter, then, then you can wing it sometimes. And we wing a lot of things sometimes. But when things really matter, we lean into proven models because people have lived before us and they've left clues. Success leaves clues, right? So the millionaire real estate agent model, there is this lead generation model. And I'm just gonna kind of show you this. This is a figure right out of the book that I enhanced a little bit. And if you think about your world of people, right? Your sphere of influence. And I think sometimes we sometimes confuse the phrase sphere of influence with our database. We think about it in lots of different ways. The truth of the matter is we don't always have influence over everyone in our world. Can we agree that that's true? There's a lot of people in our world that we know that we don't really have that much influence with. 
I sometimes question how much influence I have with people in the house that I live with me, right? So here's the thing. Your world is kind of broken into these concentric rings. And I'm gonna overlay and make sure that we're all clear about the language, the database language that we're using in Keller Williams right now, as it relates to your command database. On the outside ring of this bullseye would be sort of the general public. These are people that you haven't met, but you know who they are and you know how to reach them. Now, who can give me some examples of how you could get information of somebody who you haven't met, but maybe they would be a good candidate to do business with you and you know who they are and you know how to find them. Any examples of how you could find a person like that? Feel free to unmute and or put it in chat. It's a little trickier for me to monitor chat. Should I call on someone? I don't want to do that. <laughs> well, I'm thinking maybe uh, if you directly do an ad through social media to buyers, those are general public and people you haven't met yet. Yeah, that's one way, right? And that's historically one of the ways that we get in front of those people is we market to them, right? Right. Or you could get a list of names. You could download the tax record and find out who lives in what house and maybe they're in the target market that you want to do business with. What happens is people that we haven't met and even people that we haven't met, but they're very specifically targeted because we think that they're a good candidate for us. Maybe they live in the town that we want to do business in. Maybe they've um, of a certain demographic that we want to do business with. In the language of command, just to start out with, what we're calling those folks right now are leads. They're not a relationship yet, but I know where you are and you are a real person, and I can have one-way communication with you. Whether I purchase your email address and telephone number, whether I mail you something to your home, I have the ability for one-way contact. We're calling that person a lead. And then when that person responds and we engage in communication, we're calling that person a contact. And in the MREA model, in the book model, we move inside these rings from people that we haven't met to people that we have met. Now our contacts are people that we are engaged with, right? Now the truth of the matter is, not everybody needs you all the time, right? How often does the average person need a real estate agent? Let's be honest. I use the analogy sometimes like dentists. We don't need or think of our dentists all the time. But this morning at about 9.30, I broke a tooth. And believe me, my dentist is the person I'm thinking about right now. And we're kind of like that, right? It's, it's we, people don't think about real estate until they need us. And when they do need us, they raise their hand and say, hey, I need a real estate agent. And in the language of command, we're calling that person an opportunity, okay? Everybody clear on the difference between the three? A lead is a person that's legitimate person out there, one-way communication, a contact, two-way exchange, an opportunity is when one of those people raises their hands and says, I have a real estate need, right? And an opportunity is a person who's got that need and gives you an opportunity to solve. So here's the thing about working in your database and cultivating advocates, which we're going to move into now. Every interaction that you have in your community is designed to strengthen the relationships with people and create advocates, moving people from those outer rings of that relationship to the inner rings of the relationship and generating business opportunities all along the way, right? That's the goal of our database strategy. How do I communicate in such a way that I move people from this outer ring to the inner ring? Now the inner ring, I've met you. And then people that we've met and we nurture in a very specific way get to be what we call allied resources, right? Many of those allied resources are people that their business thrives when we thrive. We think about allied resources as, as maybe um, uh, home inspectors or real estate attorneys that we all have a mutual interest in working with this population in the very inner ring of this allied resources. And it's not even in the model. This is where we're gonna find our advocates. This is where we're gonna create our advocates of people who are gonna speak on our behalf and help grow our business for us. So there's two types of advocates, guys. There's people who will consistently provide opportunities for you if you ask them. 
And then there's people who will consistently provide unsolicited opportunities. Now, this is not an IQ test, but quick show of hands or quick response, which would you prefer? Both of these kinds of advocates are great. Which would you prefer to have more of in your database? People that will give you leads if you ask them or people that just come and bring you leads without you having to ask them for them. Which would you prefer? Anybody? Yeah, the first one. <laughs> or the, the one who do unsolicited. They just, yeah, don't no, just, just bring me opportunities, right? So we're going to talk about how to develop both. But man, that second one, who just brings you opportunities that you don't even have to necessarily ask them for, that is like gold. Now, I want to just focus on the thought here. Anybody recognize this guy? This is Gary Vaynerchuk. Anybody know Gary? Gary V. <laughs> Gary V. There's some Gary V fans out there. All right. So what I can tell you about Gary V, probably one of the most um, sought after marketers of our generation. Uh, built multi-million dollar businesses largely through social media marketing and um, is, is really quite, a, quite an amazing talent. Here's what Gary says. And in typical Gary form, um, Gary Vaynerchuk does kind of uh, have a longshoreman's vocabulary. But here's what Gary says. He says, you know, everybody cares about dumb blank, blank, blank data. Nobody cares how many followers you have. It's how many followers care that matters. What Gary says is in nurturing our relationships when we're, when we're building advocates, it's not about going wider and trying to get a big, big, big database. It's about building real relationships with people. It's not about you know, width, it's about depth. Does that make sense? You know, because I talk to agents all the time and a lot of agents tell me how thrilled they are that they've got this wonderful database. And I say, awesome, how many people do you have in your database? And they tell me, you know, they look at the thing and they tell me, I got 4,000 people in my database. I got 4,000 folks. And I'm like, that's awesome. How many business, how many transactions did you close last year? Seven. And I'm like, you got 4,000 people in your database and you close seven transactions. That database is not deeply nurtured, right? We're going to talk about how to do that today in building advocates. Now, there's two strategies that we're going to talk about today. Strategy number one is how to grow advocates in your database, people who will bring you business or give it to you when you ask. We're gonna do one strategy, which is how to create that organically, just through how we work our database. And then the second strategy is how do I strategically build advocates? We're gonna talk about both of those. And again, feel free to stop me at any point if you have any questions. Let's start with the organic growth model though, creating and nurturing advocates inside your database. The idea is in order for people to be willing to help you, you have to make yourself more helpable, right? I don't know if that's a real world word, but I'm gonna use it. How do you make yourself more helpable? Someone that people are willing to go out of their way to help you. And let's talk about how to do this. I'm going to go back to Brian Buffini again. And again, if you don't know Brian, go Google him. Some of the best real estate or business training out there is, 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 through, is done through Brian and his organization. He has what he calls the three C's model, right? Here's what he says. C number one, you have to contact people, right? You can't be helpable. You can't build a relationship if you're not in contact with people consistently across multiple channels, meaning we can't use the same thing. It can't be email after email after email or text after text after text or social media post after social media post. We've got to mix it up. We've got to contact them. And the key word here is consistently. And I'll give you a model for what that frequency should look like in a minute. Consistent, multi-channel and personal. It's got to be something that's relevant to them. When we're contacting people, it has to be something that's important to them, not us. The second C, care, right? We've, you guys have heard it a million times probably that nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care, right? The care has to be genuine. It has to be authentic. And again, how do you do that? You do that by finding out what matters to them and communicating about those things, right? 
And the third C is community. Part of what we wanna do in building an advocate-based database is positioning ourselves inside of our community. And this is, again, I'm gonna go back to Gary V again for a second. What Gary talks about again and again and again is how do you build community and make yourself the mayor? That's his phrase. You wanna become the mayor of your world. And what does that mean? What it means is that you become an invaluable member, that you're the person that people go to when they need things done. It's not necessarily that they go to you only when they've got a real estate need, but they reach out to you when they want a referral for a contractor, or they reach out for you when they uh, want to find out information about who's a really good caterer for their grandchild's bat mitzvah, whatever it is, if you can position yourself as somebody who is in the center of your community with invaluable information, that's what Gary's strategy and Brian's strategy of how you build this kind of relationship. Too many times what we do is we think about only the real estate transaction and not about how can I find a way to earn the right to stay in your life, to earn the right to be in your life, even when you don't need me in the real estate transaction, right? That's the All right. I'm not sure whose phone that is. Robbie, is that your phone? I'm I'm trying sure. to turn it off if we can. I'll see if I can mute folks too. Okay, let's keep going. So here's the thing, your database smart plans, guys, inside of command, what we give you is these smart plans. What do smart plans do? They give you a systematic way of communicating in repeated ways with your database, which is consistent enough to trigger something that's called the mere exposure effect. Now, if, if anybody was in the jumpstart class, I started to talk about this yesterday. Anybody familiar with this social psychology phenomenon called mere exposure? Show of hands, anybody? No? All right, let me, I'm gonna take you back. Some of you know that I was a psychotherapist by training in my previous life before real estate. So I always like to give you a little bit of the psychology of sales, right? One of the things that happens in social psychology is the more you over time uh, come in contact with somebody, the more exposure you have you begin to develop a preference for that thing, right? It's a person, it's a thing. It's called the familiarity effect sometimes. The more you see something, the more you feel familiar with it. And here's the way that human brains are hardwired as part of our survival. We trust things that feel familiar. We feel safe with things that feel familiar. The things that scare us are the uncertainties. That's just the way the human brain is wired. And so what we know is that through repeat exposure again and again and again, you begin to feel comfortable, you begin to feel comfortable. And at some point, comfort and familiarity tips into preference. I, I've given by way of example, anybody ever see uh, big Rob Dukansky's head on a bus or a train or a billboard, right? Everywhere you go in New Jersey, you know, Rob sells NJ.com, right? You see him all over the place. What is his end game here? Because I'm telling you, there is tens of thousands, approaching hundreds of thousands of dollars invested in this strategy. What his end game is, is that if you see him enough times, at some point, you're going to feel like you know him. And if you feel like you know him, when he and his team show up prospecting, they're going to develop some preference. Here's kind of how it works. On the right here side, on the right hand side here, it's almost like the first time you hear a song right? New artist. You hear the song comes out off their new album, not their very best work. You're not loving it. But after a few times you hear it, you're kind of like, hey, I'm kind of digging this. It's kind of a good song. After you hear it all summer long, it's like you're kind of getting into it. You really love it. That's what happens. That's the phenomenon. And so our strategy for starters is in order for people to advocate on our behalf, they have to like you and they have to trust you. The likability factor comes through mere exposure. There is a reason why, and I'm going to take a risk and not try to be political here, but there's a reason why reality TV hosts can be elected to the highest office in the land because people feel that they know this person on some level because they see them so often, right? Let's move on. The smart plans are designed to build relationships. Information is focused on topics that matter to your audience. Now, I want to stop talking for a minute and get you guys involved. 
When I say that your smart plans, that your, 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 your touch campaigns should focus on things that matter to your audience, how would you think about that? How would you do that? What kinds of topics might you include? I'd love to have you guys think about this a little bit because what we know what we can send easily is real estate related stuff. Here's what's going on in your neighborhood that's relevant to you, but what other kinds of ways can we send information that matters to our topic audience to build relationship? Probably you could do a newsletter on what's important to them in the spring, how to fix, how to do fix up and that sort of thing. All right, so seasonally, right? We know that these seasonal repairs are relevant to your life right now because it's the summer or it's the spring or it's the fall. How else would you think about that? And flag people in your database by interest levels. Yeah, you, you can use tags to, you know, mark people as they maybe you know they live in a certain town or whatever um so you can send you know an email out to everybody who lives in summit for instance when the farmer's market's starting you know right because that's relevant to them because it's a summit farmer's market i used to create tags in my database back in the day we didn't quite tag it the same way but for those of you that know me you know i'm a little bit of a foodie and and so i used to tag i used to get into conversations with people and at some point we would, we would talk a little bit about things that were interesting to them. And I had some friends of mine that were craft beer people and I had some friends of mine that were wine lovers and I had some friends of mine that were vegans and I had some friends. And so I would put those tags out there. And then whenever something relevant came up, a new microbrewery opens up, I come across a great vegan recipe. I send it out to the people that that's relevant to and it speaks just to them. And that's the kind of stuff that takes your canned off the shelf stock information that you send through your touch campaigns and makes it personal and makes it relevant. And inside your database, you're gonna have lots of different audiences. You're gonna have lots of different people that have lots of different interests based on lots of different things. Ron, I hope you're teaching classes on how to do tagging, right? Because there's gonna be lots of different tags here. And when you do that, and when you build this relationship and you start to find out who is your ideal audience, who is the best ideal audience for you to do business with, what begins to happen is our touch campaigns begin to build legitimate relationships and not just push out spammy information. Can we feel the difference between those two? Anybody have any examples of how they've used their touch campaigns to personalize them in, in a way like this? Quiet group, you're making me do a lot of heavy lifting here today. Anybody got examples of that? I know I'm looking at who's on here. I know there's some people who do this really well. I mean, certainly the, the neighborhood nurture emails are, are the easiest way to get people, you know, the real estate information that everybody's curious about, like, you know, how much that house is down the block. Right. And that's a simple baseline, right? We know that people want to know about what's going on in their neighborhood. That's an easy layup. Once a month, twice a month, we can send them that, right? You know, the personal interactions are largely focused on, hey, you know, what can I do for you today? How can I serve you, right? So, so let's, let's keep moving. It's all about building a database and adding value. And by the way, this is how you're going to handle disruption in our industry. You know, I know that so many agents are concerned about all the disruption that's out there with companies like that one that starts with the name Z, letter Z and sounds like the word pillow that I'm not allowed to say without bursting into flames. There's so many agents that are so concerned that those kinds of companies or the tech company startups are gonna come and trash our business model, that they're going to come in with these models that say, we can offer you cash for your home and pay you out in two weeks without a home inspection. And, and we, we see companies like OfferPad and an and open door companies like this who are offering that kind of disruption right now that they're going to siphon off our business that somehow that somehow uh, people are going to be drawn to the discount brokerage who's going to take our business away from us because they're doing it for such a little commission look here's the truth the way you manage disruption is have a strong value proposition and a real relationship it's got to be both and the same holds true for building an advocate you can't have it just be a strong value proposition alone without a good relationship. 
because those folks are vulnerable to, to just follow that new shiny thing. And you can't just have a relationship without a value proposition because there's not enough to prevent people from finding that new shiny thing. But the antidote to disruption is to do both. Have a great value proposition and the kind of a relationship that we're talking about here. Here's the model, guys. How frequently do you need to be in touch with your database to build the kind of relationship that it takes to develop an advocate? And believe me, the next we're going to get right now into the second half of this is how to build the advocate, but it starts on the relationship. Without a relationship, I can't do this. Here's the frequency for your leads. Now go back to the definition of a lead. Remember, Frank, we talked about this. A lead is somebody that I know who you are and I know where you are, but we're not having an engaged conversation yet. I can reach out to you and you're not saying, leave me alone. You're not calling the police. You're not unsubscribing, right? It takes 19 touches a year to develop the familiarity that it takes for people to feel comfortable enough many times to engage. That's what we find. It takes about 19 touches a year to trigger that familiarity effect that causes people to feel comfortable enough to reach back out. Now, that's not to say that, that you might not get an opportunity, that somebody reaches out to you, sends you an email or text and says, you know what, Tracy, I've been getting your emails for three years. You've been super persistent and I th we're now ready to list our home. Can you come and talk to us? You sometimes can have leads reach out to you without ever having them become a contact. But once you've developed that contact relationship, here's what our research shows. And we've been tracking this at Keller Williams now for 30 years. Every year we track this data. We've got hundreds and hundreds of agents who report their data and their conversion to KW International so that we can see how this works. It takes about 36 touches a year to convert somebody to become a willing advocate, somebody who will refer business when asked or refer business without being asked, right? Unsolicited opportunities. It takes about three times a month. And I always, always, always hear people being so concerned about that. People saying, you know what? At what point do I get arrested for being the creepy stalker realtor guy? Look, I don't, I don't want you to do that. Right? And I'm looking now because I haven't been able to see the this, this screen here when I've got the PowerPoint up. Most of you are off camera. If you, could, if you guys could get on camera so when I look, I could see faces, that would always make it easier for me. But I'd love to ask somebody, how do you do this without coming off as creepy and over, overbearing? Somebody who's not a tech trader. How do you do this three times a month, 36 times a year to be in front of them again and again and again and again without having it seem like, leave me the hell alone, I'm tired. Well, I think like you said, to make it personal and relevant to them where they're actually interested in hearing about what you have to say and oh my God, bombarding yeah. them with real estate data. No, you know how many, how many real estate um, plans I get put on? I've got like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of real estate friends of mine in different companies all around the country. And, and I get put on their drip campaigns. And do you know how annoying it gets to be after a while? It's just, it's the same email from the same company. And when they choose to drop it, I get like 65 of them all in the same hour. Look, that's not meaningful. What is meaningful is what's relevant and multi-channel. We go back to that idea, multiple ways. Sometimes it's real estate related. Sometimes it's not real estate related. In fact, what Buffini would tell you is it's probably 50-50 because people have to like you and people have to trust you. The way they learn to trust you is when you send them information that shows that you understand the real estate market. When you send them information about what's happening in their community, when you send them information about what homes are selling for and list to sell ratios look like and all that stuff, that's how they trust that you're competent. How do they like you is when you send them stuff that matters to them. And so we need both right? It's got to be a good balance, but it's 36 times a year. And here's what these conversions become. Does anybody know how these plans, these are models, when results matter, predictability matters, then lean into a model. Does anybody know what the conversion rate is on these two follow-up models? Well, here's what they are. The lead model, 19 touches a year. 
not engaged with me, not responding back necessarily, but hearing from me 19 times a year. How would I do that? Maybe once a month, they get a neighborhood nurture showing what's going on in their neighborhood with housing. Maybe um, a few times a month, maybe four times a year, I give them a phone call. And people say, but how they're not responding to me. Why should I call them? Because I want them to hear your voice message. Hey, it's Hal, reach it back out again. I know we met at an open house way back in September. Not sure if you found one or not yet, but I'm still out here and available. If you need anything, here's how you reach me. Have a tip, great day. Four times a year that, a couple times a year, you invite them to a community event. You send them some branded thing, whatever it is. 19 times a year converts at 50 to one predictably. What does that mean? For every 50 people in your database that you had that level of engagement, you can pretty much count on one closing a year. That's pretty amazing. The 36 touch converts at 10 to one. For every 10 people that are willing to hear from you with that level of frequency, with that level of engagement, that converts at a 10 to one ratio. Now, some of those people will use it themselves. Some of those people will advocate on your behalf. But that's the game. That's the game is how do we get people into our pipeline as leads, turn them into contacts, and then engage with them to this level to the point where they are willing to advocate on our behalf. Why? Because they feel so comfortable, so familiar with us. Now, it's not just the comfort zone. Here's where it tips now. This is where we get into advocacy. The law of reciprocity is a really important thing here to build advocates. And what does the law of reciprocity mean? Anybody familiar with the law of reciprocity? There's a little dictionary definition up here, but it's, can, who can give me a, just a quick working definition for how the law of reciprocity works? Yeah, you do for me, I do for you. There you go, one hand, one hand washes the other, right? I scratch your back, you scratch mine. You know, human beings, again, I'm gonna go back to behavioral psychology. Human beings have this need to have this sense of balance in our lives. When things feel unbalanced, out of balance, we like to pull things back into balance. And what does that mean in terms of reciprocity? When I do something for you, you feel compelled to do something for me because that brings us back into balance. When I go and I wanna meet somebody and I go up to Carissa and I say, hi, my name is Hal, what's your name? What is Carissa most likely to do? She's most likely to give me her name because I did it first. If I just went up to Carissa on the street and said, hey lady, what's your name? You know what she's gonna to say to me? She's gonna say, get away from me, creepy guy and reach into her purse for her mace. But when I, when I start by saying, hey, my name is Hal, what's your name? That's the law of reciprocity. And here's the thing that I believe with every ounce of fiber in my body, people are good and want to do good things for other people. I totally believe that. I totally, I know it's hard sometimes. You don't always believe that's true if you spend too much time on social media. You don't always believe that the world is full of good people if you spend too much time watching the news, but I'm here to tell you that people are different than what the media portrays. People at their very core are good and they want to help other people. Now here's, here's the unfortunate reality. They don't want to help you grow your business because your business need is not their problem. And so part of what we have to think about doing when building advocates is to find a way to give them an opportunity to tap in that, into that innate desire to help other people and have our business be the vehicle by which they do that, right? The, the most effective way to do that is, is, is by positioning yourself as an advocate. What does an advocate do? Now, we're talking about an advocate-based business. Start by positioning yourself as an advocate on behalf of your clients, right? When you, anybody have any buyers right now that they're working with that haven't been able to get a house because the housing market's been so hot, they put in offers and they got shut out. Anybody have that happen, right? I see a couple of hands, right? For those of you on camera, Here's the thing that it gives us an opportunity to do. It gives us an opportunity to be a hero by reaching out into our community and asking people if they can help us help our clients. Here's the script. Ron, would you be willing to role play with me for a minute? I'm going to be the agent. You're going to be the homeowner. Sure. And it's a simple script that sounds a little bit like this. Ring, ring. 
Hello. Hi, is this uh, Ron at 125 Main Street? Uh, yes, who's calling? Hey, Ron, my name is Hal Benz and I'm a local realtor. And you know, you may think this is going to come way out of the blue and you may think I'm a little bit crazy, but have you thought about selling your home now or sometime maybe within the next year or two? Um, no, no, nothing, nothing that soon. You know, hey, look, I honestly didn't expect you to say yes. In fact, if you did, I might have fainted. But here's the thing. You know, the reason I'm calling you, Ron, is I'm working with this amazing family, the Blakes. And, and I've been working with, with Ventress and her family now for about three months. We've been trying to find a home in this community. And because the market has been so hot, we have really had a hard time doing it. Perhaps you've heard about how hot the market's been. Absolutely, yeah. You know what? Here's the thing, Ron. I promised Ventress and her family that I would do whatever it took. Even if it meant knock on every single door and ring every single doorbell and call every single person in town to see if I could find someone that might be interested to help her and her family. And so I hear you saying that maybe this isn't the right time for you. Is there anyone that you know that maybe would be thinking about selling their home within the next year or two? Um, you should probably, you know, try my neighbor down the block. Uh, they've been there forever and, and uh, you know. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And let's break script here. Guys, that's the tone of this. Here's what happens. When you show up as a realtor who is not looking for something for themselves, but looking to invite them to help someone else, when you position yourself as an advocate, you create advocates. And one of the reasons why is because people are good and they're looking to do good things for other people. And I would contend that right now in society today, people are desperate to find an outlet to do good things. I think people are so exhausted and forlorn and worn out with COVID and politics and all the things that are taking our so much energy away from us that if you can invite people into an opportunity to make a difference, a positive difference in the world, they are tripping over themselves to do it. That's part of how we do this organically is to reach into our database and to ask people by positioning ourselves as an advocate, who do they know that they can advocate on behalf of? The, the goal is this, you're gonna be the guide to show them how to become a hero of someone else's story, right? It's not about who do you know that I can help. That's too commonly what our scripts sound like. Hey, I've got this goal to help 27,000 families this year. Who do you know that I can help? That is a not a very, that's not an uncommon script, but that is not as compelling as, let me introduce you to someone that perhaps you can help. It's a very different invitation, right? Do you feel the difference between those two? And I'm gonna encourage you to start when you build these kinds of relationships in your database, to reach into your database with regularity, not to say, hey, I need a lead. Hey, I need a lead. I've got plenty of scripts like that. I'm gonna encourage you to start by advocating on behalf of the people who you are serving and invite people to help you, you're gonna find amazing opportunities there. You know, I, I'll share with you, it's the, it's, the, it's the foundation of how things like GoFundMe work. It just believes in the goodness of human nature. And if you've ever gone to a GoFundMe page and I just clipped this one off the internet, I don't know who Justin is, but here's what I know. Justin apparently needs a kidney transplant. And in seven days, 4,257 people raised $88,000 for Justin's kidney. I got to believe that of that 4,257, a lot of those people didn't have any idea who Justin was. But they saw this picture and they saw a need and they wanted to help. And I think there's an amazing opportunity for us to leverage that goodness in our database once we've built relationships. I also think this works as a reasonably good cold call. When somebody that you know wants to live in a target community and you target that community and you just go door to door if you have to, with this script that says, I promise them, that's where you shift your lead generation from looking for your leads to becoming an advocate. It's those magic words that say, I promised them that I would do whatever it took, even if it meant interrupt your day today, even if it meant show up on your desk. I, I, the reason why I'm kind of annoying you right now, and I realize that sometimes this kind of solicitation is really annoying, and I apologize for that, but I promised them that I would try to help change their world, and I'm giving you an opportunity to help. 
I'm going to encourage you to kind of think about how you would learn build that in. Now let's change gears here in terms of how to be how to generate advocacy within your database, leveraging the law of reciprocity. If you want referrals unsolicited, give referrals unsolicited. Become the biggest referrer in your database. Every interaction that you have in your database when you're talking to people, what you're listening for is an opportunity to solve a problem, to connect one person in your database with another person in your database. I'm talking to Hal today and I learned that he chipped his tooth. Well, it just so happens that his dentist retired six months ago and he needs a new one. And I, I found one, guys, I did find one. But if that conversation happened in your database today, it's your opportunity to say, you know what? I've got a really great dentist. Let me introduce you. In fact, I'll make a phone call on your behalf to ask them to listen to your call. When we can become that kind of a matchmaker and we are the biggest referrer in our database, we open the door for the law of reciprocity. The universe has a way of rewarding us for that kind of connecting behavior. And guys, I'm not somebody who says we do this as a quid pro quo. We don't do this. We don't do this. Now let's hear this real clearly. This is not, I'm going to make a referral because I expect that that person is going to refer someone back to me. We need to be in business with local business people. We need to be in business with the small business owners in our community. We need to talk to them and know and knock on every small business person's door in your target community and find out with a script that says, hey, I'm a realtor and I help people move into this town all the time. If I found a new family who was a great candidate for the services that you provide, what would they look like? How would you tell me what your ideal customer is and then be on the lookout? And as you find a way to connect people to your dry cleaners and to your caterers and to whoever it is, becoming the biggest referrer in your database is a great way to build that kind of advocacy back especially if we've got that tipping point level of relationship where things have moved from a sense of connection to a sense of preference that comes through repetition. That's why the model says 36 times. And I know people try to butcher the model. I know people say, yeah, 36 times is just too much. I'll just tweak it down. I'll make it 20. This isn't a menu. This is a model, right? So let's keep going. The more advocate you advocate for others, the more they advocate for you. When you get that referral sidebar here, and then we're gonna change gears into how to build advocates. Sidebar, when you do get a referral, have a reward system, right? I think a lot of times, um, whether it's a Starbucks card or I, I love, one of the things, I, I came out of the nonprofit sector before real estate. I have a degree in nonprofit management from Seton Hall. And, um, you know, one of the things I love is to support local charities. And one of the easiest ways to do that is through, there's a lot of charitable gift card companies. The one that I like the best is called Tis Best Charitable Gift Cards, and there's others. And what it is, it's essentially a gift card that gives somebody 50 bucks and they get to allocate that money to the charity of their choice. Those kinds of things are cool too, right? There's lots of things that you can do, but the idea is to reward the behavior that you want to reinforce. When the referral comes, whether it's a good lead or a bad lead, whether you convert it or you don't, we reward that behavior and it strengthens it, right? Solicit testimonials, right? Once we've got this level Hal, I'm sorry, what was the last uh, bullet point on that previous list? Oh, whatever's meaningful. Whatever's stuff. meaningful to them, right? Whatever matters to them. Whatever kind of reward, if you know some things because you've built your database and you tagged it really well and you know that they happen to be somebody who, um, I don't know, collects little miniature turtles like my Aunt Josephine used to do, then another turtle for the collection could be it, right? If you went to her apartment in Irvington, she would have had hundreds of them woman lived to be 101 years old. You know how many freaking turtles she had in her apartment in Irvington? It was crazy. Anyway, that aside, whatever matters to them. Last thing before we get to engineering advocates, when you've got this level of relationship, when that is so much beyond just, I know who you are, but I've developed this preference. 
this is where we're going to do good things. We're going to help them and refer things to help them, provide information to them that's useful to them. One of the things I just saw somebody do, a guy that I used to coach has been doing this every year and he just did it again. I heard from him about a week ago. Are you guys familiar that the state of New Jersey has a lost property department? It's kind of like in, in school where there was a big box and anybody who lost their sneakers, you'd go to the box and stuff would end up there. Well, here's what happens in the state. If you've got money in a bank account or a credit card account or something like that, that gets closed, it's the obligation of that vendor to try to return that to you. If they can't find you, it's the obligation to return it to the state. And it's the state's job to try to find you and let you know that you've got this inheritance from a long lost great grandfather that you never knew existed or whatever it is. The problem is the state of New Jersey doesn't have the bandwidth to go looking for people. But if you go to them, they can tell you whether or not you've got any kinds of things available. And so a friend of mine, as one of his touches every single year, would send out information on how to contact the state of New Jersey to see if there was anything that was existed in the lost property or the, the lost accounts. And he would just provide that information every year and without fail, and it happened again last week, he gave me an information back. He said, you know what? I sent that out to my database and I had a person who called and sure enough found out that there had been a bank account with a balance that had gotten apparently too low or whatever it was and they closed out that account, but there was several hundred dollars that they had no idea was there and they had filed for it and they got it. And they said, you know what? I so appreciate you letting me know that that existed. I never would have got those few hundred dollars. Do you think you can get people to like you when you do stuff like that? There's a million different ways, guys. And when you do that, that's when that testimonial becomes easier to give, right? Get those testimonials. Last few things here, protect your numbers, right? Remember what I said is people aren't gonna risk their social capital just because we've got a relationship. They've gotta believe that you can deliver the goods which means you have to make sure your value proposition stays strong. You've got to make sure that your list, your days on market numbers are competitive. Your list to sell ratio numbers are competitive. All right, data is the language of real estate. It's objective, it's unbiased, it's evidence. The way that we overcome the disruptors in our industry is to build advocates who trust us enough because we've got evidence that we've got a strong value proposition and they like us enough because we're engaged, right? You got to become what Seth Godin calls a purple cow. Anybody read any of Seth Godin's books? Seth Godin is just, again, another great, wonderful marketer. And, and Purple Cow is, is one of his great books. Seth's books tend to be small. They're, they're easy reads, a lot of them. Anybody have Purple Cow on their bookshelf? No? All right, here's the idea. You want to be remarkable. And what is a purple cow? If you travel across the country and you see cows, the world is full of cows. And cows are big and they're smelly and they're black and they're white and they got spots. But if you're driving down the street and you saw this one that was purple, what would you do? You would stop the car. You would take a picture. You would send to all your friends, oh my God, you're not going to believe what I just saw. You would put it on all your social media channels. I saw this purple cow. When you kind of become remarkable, let's go back to the root word of that someone who's worthy to remark about, someone who's willing to speak on behalf of, when you've got that strong of a value proposition and a relationship-based database of people who are willing to help you, now you become more helpable. That said, last few minutes here, let's talk strategically because you can organically build this database doing the things that we've done, who are people who will give you the leads when you ask. And again, I think the best ask is the advocate ask. Invite them to help you help someone else. But it still puts the onus on you to go out and do the asking. The other half of this database is people who just bring leads to you. And that requires that we have to get in the pathway of people that I call gatekeepers. In the pathway of people who tend to need to buy and sell real estate at predictable times, who is in the path of their like during those predictable times? So, so real quick, someone unmute. What are the predictable life cycle events that trigger the sale or purchase of real estate? Weddings and divorces, babies, deaths and births. Yeah, all those things, right? 
So one of the relocation. things that we start to think about is who else, right? Growing families, shrinking families, job relocations, changing physical needs. Who is in the pathway of people who are having these kinds of needs, who's, who, who are looking to help these families solve these problems? And how can we get into relationship with those folks who I call gatekeepers, who has access? Right. How can I get in the relationship with somebody who's a gatekeeper? They have access to somebody that I don't, who has a real estate related need, and it's their job or responsibility to try to help them solve that problem, but they're not a realtor. Right. I'll give you an example of a gatekeeper. One would be an estate planning attorney. Does an estate planning attorney ever come across a family that needs to buy or sell real estate, but they're not real estate agents? Right. Give me some other descriptions, titles of people that could be gatekeepers. Well, I've taken this um, class before, so. Um, we touch on this I, at I, night, I, right? We do I, touch yeah, on this at night. I remember you talking about um, the uh, at the jewelry store, like the you know where people buy engagement rings and stuff. It's, yeah, and Ignite, I gave that example of my friend Stan, who worked as a, as a jewelry store, right? And as people would come to, as guys would come essentially to buy engagement rings, he'd ask them about their housing needs, right? Now, that's not necessarily a gatekeeper in the traditional sense, because that's somebody, the need isn't a real estate need at the moment they come in. I'm thinking more like divorce mediators, but part of uncoupling sometimes is what do we do with this house? And I don't think a divorce attorneys often are as impactful as divorce mediators. One of the things my experience has told me is that by the time that we're in a litigation, oftentimes there's, there's tension and polarization and, and we're not necessarily all pulling in the same direction. When we are in a place where couples are uncoupling in, in a way that there's still relationship and they're still talking to each other and they're still trying to find a way to do this nicely and maintain a sense of relationship there, mediators can be great for that. What happens with, with, with litigators, with divorce attorneys, frequently the husband wants his agent, the wife wants her agent, and the judge is the one who assigns the agent. So by the way, a judge, a, a family court judge, could be a very good gatekeeper. And I know an agent in the Ridgewood Market Center who has made quite a number of deals by getting into relationship with family court judges. Some others, assisted living coordinators, corporate relocation directors, right? The idea is these are people that are in the pathway of people that need a realtor. And we want to show up not to say, hey, you come across a lot of people who need a realtor. Can you give me leads? Can you give me leads? No, it's this. I know that in the service of, that you provide to your clients, there's times when your clients need to sell or buy or invest in real estate, and that's not what you do. Let me show you how I can help you solve their need. You feel the different approach here, right? And so the idea is build a relationship with the gatekeepers, right? And when we build that relationship with frequency of database touches again and again and again, and we do positive things to them, referring people to their services, the law of reciprocity comes in and they refer to us. These are the groups that tend to do it unsolicited. And again, you know, the answer always comes down to what's in it for me, W-I-I-F-M, everybody's favorite radio station, right? The call letter stand, what's in it for me? The gatekeepers solving, our job is to solve their problem, not to see if we can get the benefit of the leads they can provide for us, right? It's a different approach. The gatekeepers need, how do I solve their problem? How do I provide value for them? Business networking groups can be a wonderful source of people advocating for you. I'm in a networking group. I've got an attorney. I've got a real estate agent. I've got a CPA. Every time I get a chance to refer a CPA, I'm going to refer Larry here. Every time anybody needs a realtor, they're going to refer me. These are professional networking groups that are built around the idea of advocating to grow each other's business. We can and probably should think about cultivating professional relationship group like this. Anybody familiar with any of the, the groups that are out there that do this already, the national groups? BNI. BNI. Yeah, BNI. BNI, Business Networking International. There's another group called LATIP. 
I think these are organizations that I think each one of us should consider joining. Now, I do know that sometimes people reach out to these groups and they say, well, they all the groups are taken up. Well, then start your own, right? Start your own. I know plenty of folks who say, if BNI doesn't have a chapter or I don't want to pay their dues, then I'm going to build my own informally. I'm just going to go into my networks and find an attorney and a CPA and a whatever, and I build that group myself. But these kinds of groups can be great for advocating. Um, referral partners in other with other agents, right? The law of reciprocity. When I send business, I'm more likely to receive business. I would encourage you guys to get familiar with the command referral pattern module. And again, I teach this in Ignite. For those of you that have taken Ignite with me, Ron, do you guys teach this at all in part of your command training or any of the tech trainers that might be on right now? Yeah, I've, I've taught this, uh, I guess, maybe a month, about a month ago. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? You mm -hmm. can go in and say, okay, in my target market, where are people typically coming from? And in my target market, where are people likely to go to? Can I build a reciprocal relationship in each one of those markets, right? It's a great way to build advocates. When you've built that relationship, we nurture it the same way. And then finally, and here's the last, the last little tidbit. And again, if you've been at Ignite, you've heard this one before, but this is my painter strategy. And I wanna share this with you because guys, this is gold. Had an agent who worked for me a long time ago back in the Princeton market when I used to manage for another company. This was 2006-ish. And he was a guy who got his real estate license after having been in the, uh, he was a research scientist for pharma college, pharmaceutical company. And he worked in, in that corridor there. If you know the 202 corridor that goes down through Princeton, there were at one time a lot of big pharma companies there and several of them are still there. And he was a, a research chemist actually and his, the R&D department of his company got offshored. They went to India, he wasn't going with them. He decided to stay and he got his real estate license. And he came to me and he said, look, here's my challenge. I came here from California, everyone that I know is based in California for the most part. But I'm not moving back to California because I did actually find a woman here and we're gonna get married. She's got some kids and we're gonna sort of establish this life here. But if I said, where's my sphere of influence? It ain't in New Jersey. And he says, but I have this idea. And, and I love sometimes you know, researchers because they tend to be really good problem solvers a lot of times. Here's what he said, here's my strategy. He says, I believe that when people are getting ready to sell their house, there are certain things that they do in preparation. And if I can get in the pathway and incentivize some of those folks, I think it could work really well for me. And here's what he said. I believe that one of the things that people do when they get their house ready before they hire an agent is they get it painted. Quick show of hands. Does that make sense? Do we paint it before we bring a real estate agent in? Many, many times we do. And so what he says is, I'm going to go out and I'm going to reach out to all the painting contractors in the county. And he looked up on the internet and... Um, you know, there was dozens and dozens of them. And he said, look, here's the pitch. He says, I'm going to go to them and I'm going to say to them, look, I understand that your business can be cyclical. That sometimes in the summertime, there's a lot of work, but in the wintertime, there's only interior work. And in the wintertime, sometimes what happens is right after the winter holidays, like Christmas and Hanukkah, when people get their first credit card bills and they see how much they spent in the holidays, they don't feel like they've got any money to spend on home upgrades. And so things in those winter months can get kind of lean. And he said to them, I'm going to say to them too, that I know that if you've got a plow and put it on the front of your truck, if we've got snow, sometimes you can plow your way through a lean winter. But many times, if the weather doesn't cooperate, there's months that things get really, really tight. And here's what my pitch is. During a quiet time in your business, I'm going to ask you to go to real estate school and get a license. And... I'll even pay the $199 for your licensing course. The only thing you need to do is, is get the course, pass the test, and then take the state exam. What I ask you to do that for, here's why. I would not expect you to be a real estate agent. In fact, I don't want you to be. You're a painter. But when you have a real estate license, you can put that license into a referral company. And if you find a real estate opportunity for me and refer it to me, I am gonna cut you in and give you a percentage of the commission if I take that listing. So here's what I want you to do. I'd love for you to get your license. And then as you go out, start bidding jobs. 
if anybody's getting their house painted because they're prepping to put their house on the market, I'd love for you to say, you know what, if you haven't spoken to my buddy, Ron, you should really do that. He's one of the best agents here. In fact, let me reach out to them and connect you to. And then if, if Ron gets that listing, what is he going to do? I'm going to refer you a referral, which by the way, what's the referral commission typically going to be? How much percentage of the total? 25%. 25 percent right so here's what happens he was going to offer 30 because he wanted to make sure that he made it worth their while i was blessed i had a couple people like that in my database who were in the position to find opportunities and refer them to me and because they had a real estate license i could cut them in and pay them a part of that guys if you can incentivize people this way you can actually create an advocate. And here's what happened for him. He went out and he pitched this idea to dozens and dozens of painting contractors. And here's what happened. A lot of them said, are you crazy? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Did your mama drop you on your head as a baby? Like what <laughs> made you think that that would be a good idea, right? And here's what happened. A couple of them said, you know what? That's not really that crazy. And he found about three or four people that said, you know what, I I I'll do that. I'll, I'll get that license because I do bid a lot of jobs where people are getting ready. And if you can take those listings, I'm counting on you to be my partner, have a strong enough value proposition. But if I can make this introduction and you can get that listing and close it, you're going to give me 30% of the commission dollars. I'm going to take that because if I can generate some passive residual income that way, I think it's going to help carry me through my lean months. And he found about four or five guys who did that. And each one of those guys was good for about four or five closings a year. What would it be like if you had some people in your database who you could get one or two, you could take to the bank? What would it be like if you had built an army of people? Because he went from, I don't know anybody in New Jersey and I need to get this license and how am I going to do this? To building this team of people who are incentivized <laughs> to be his advocate in his very first year, he was Circle of Excellence Gold and he went to Platinum in year two. And he did it on the back of this strategy. Guys, this isn't crazy. You could steal this. I would think about stealing this. There, are, there may be people already in your database who are natural gatekeepers, nurture them, because you do have to reward those gatekeepers differently, right? When people are feeding you, you've got to reward them, right? Significantly. Now, I just want to be real clear, and, and I recognize that we're a couple minutes over here, guys. If you have to jump off, you're not going to hurt my feelings. We're only going to go about five more minutes, tops. Just remember, if you do jump off, I do get to talk about you, but it'll be nice. Here's the thing. You do have to kind of reward what you want to see repeated. And what is the maximum amount that you can gift someone as a thank you? as a thank you reward for giving you a qualified referral that went to the closing table. What's the maximum amount that you're allowed to give by law? Does anybody know what that number is? $25. Is the maximum amount that you are allowed to claim on your taxes as a business expense. There is no limit in terms of what you can give. There's a limit on what you can claim. Now, keep in mind, it has to be a reward for a something that was done previously. It can't be an inducement. You can't go out there and say, hey, Lucy, I'll give you $25,000 if you give me a lead. That would violate the real estate commission rules. That would be an inducement. But if somebody gives you business that closes consistently and regularly, and you want to thank them in some sort of way, and you choose to do that, I know people who have given trips to uh, uh, the Cayman Islands, I know people who have made sizable contributions to nonprofit organizations in the name of the person because it was an organization that they believed in. There is nothing that prohibits that. The only prohibition is you can't claim all that, right? But think about that, right? Think about how do you incentivize people? If you can get them licensed and cut them in on the deal, that's great. If they can't get licensed and they do refer business that closes, find a way to, to reward them in a way that's meaningful. Right, that, that would be my two cents on that. Just imagine what would it be like if you had a couple people that could guarantee you two closings a year. How about five or 10? The gatekeepers can get you to those numbers. How do you incentivize those gatekeepers to be the ones who now become your advocates? Two ways to build advocates, guys. Organically through database management, 
nurture those relationships and then leverage the law of reciprocity. When I've got the relationship, how do you become more helpable by doing more good things for other people? The law of reciprocity is it. It's not quid pro quo. It's not, you know what, David, if you don't give me this lead, I'm cutting you off. It's, I'm just going to do whatever I can to help you every single which way I can so that you're more inclined to help me back. And if I can incentivize you as well and engineer an incentive for you to become an advocate, that much the better. So that's my two cents on how to go and think, think about doing this. Um, I guess I, I'll end it with this focusing question. What's the one thing that you could do today such that by doing it, you could move closer to having an advocate-based business, right? Because otherwise, here's the thing, guys, I, I don't want this to just be edutainment. I don't want this to be, well, this is a pretty good use of an hour because I didn't have to actually do any work. It was fun to listen to this. This was interesting. The reason why I took an hour out of my life to share with you is because I want you to do this. Because this, more than anything else, has seemed to become a game changer for people. It takes all the pressure off your lead gen. You're not going to necessarily build this whole army of advocates in day one. But if you can start with one and then two and make it a point to nurture your database and to create this again and again and again, when your database is working on your behalf and speaking on your behalf and finding leads for you, it takes all the pressure off of running your business. Yes, you still have to do your own lead gen. But so much of what you do in your lead generation and your lead follow-up is continue to fill the funnel and then spend your energy nurturing in the way we just talked about. So with that, I'm going to ask for a couple of ahas. We'll clear the room. What was the one thing that you heard today that you did not know or something that's got you curious? Any takeaways from today? Yeah, definitely. I'm going to tag that database, um, distill it down to different segments a little bit tighter. I think that's brilliant. It, you know what? And I wish I could say that I stole that idea from, it was not mine. It's Gary Keller's, you know, but here's what it does. It allows your database to be personalized. Nobody, nobody wants all that same old, same old, you know, you get the same old staging technique thing from every real estate agent in the county. What you want is a tag that's relevant to them. The way Ron mentioned here, let me tell you about the Summit Farmers Market because I know that matters to you because that's how I tagged you, right? Love, love, love that. That's a big takeaway. Anything else? Yeah, what somebody just put in the chat, like building my own network group. And I've said that to myself before. And I think that's going to be one of my... I learned that from a friend of mine who came to an office that I was coaching in. And she came from New York and she had a big business in New York. Her husband was a financial advisor and she was a real estate agent. And all the professional groups like BNI and Latip or whatever, they had their token agents. So she said, the hell with it. We're going to build our own. She went, they went into their LinkedIn networks and, and they decided to build their own. Now, here's what they learned that I'll share with you. It's easier to build a network of people who are in the growth phase of their own businesses rather than somebody who's already at the success phase of their business. You're looking to grow. You want to sort of birds of a feather on this. If you go to a CPA or an attorney who's in business 30 years, the likelihood is they've got relationships already. You want to get on the leading edge of people who don't have as many yet and earn the right to their relationship. One more, one more takeaway and we'll call it quits. We'll just have to uh, time block. You know, some of these networking events, sometimes it's on the phone talking to them. Sometimes it's actually gathering a few people to have a beer and just talk about what's going on. So uh, some of that is rather specific time blocking because because that doesn't normally happen during the day because people are busy. Yeah. And um, uh, so you have to make the time for that. You have to make the time. And we're going to go back to models again. Right. When success, when outcomes matter then we focus on predictable models. And what we know is that a timed blocked model works. The question is, it's twofold. It's number one, do I time block my calendar? And then more importantly, do I follow the blocks? Because it's super easy. Like I'll show you my calendar. Here's my calendar, right? It's super easy to color code your calendar here. I don't know if you can see it. All these different color codes relate to a different time block with my screensaver on. You can't probably see it. The hard time is how do you actually follow that? And make sure that you're in the right place at the right time doing what your calendar says, right? But when you develop that habit, Randy, that's the name of the game. 
And, and it's not complicated. It just takes enough discipline to generate a habit, right? So with that, guys, we're going to call quits. I appreciate you for hanging 15 minutes long. Um, <clears throat> before everybody long jumps, business. before everybody this jumps, um, you made some great correlations between uh, the MREA and command. And my class tomorrow um, at 1130 is going to make similar cor correlations and additional ones. So uh, tune in if you can. Yeah, yeah, tune in, guys. You know, here's the thing. Everything that, that we do is how do we take this theory of practice? It's one thing to understand how to do it, then how do you use the tools, right? And we've built you the, the, great, the greatest tools out there to do this. Oh my God. Learn how to do it, right? I'm sorry, I didn't catch what the, what the other, what's happening oh. tomorrow. Ron <clears throat> has class. got a command class, right? What's your class, Ron? It's called the top three reasons you should be using command and the three applets that will make you money. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. The three apples that'll make you money. I may have to tune into that one myself because I can yeah. use a little more money. All right, guys. Hope this was valuable to you today. If you have any questions, reach back out to me. Have yourselves a good afternoon. We'll talk to you all again soon. Thanks, Tom.